Hello. I apologize in advance for subjecting you to Ben Shapiro today, but he seems to have taken a break from staring at his sister's Instagram to deliver in the latest trend of insufferable liberals, the fake investigative journalist shtick. China, you've been told, is a rising power. I blame Johnny Harris for this, with his incredibly performative Vice News delivery and superficial Google search delivered research. Ben, or more accurately his marketing people, saw how popular this style is and are cashing in. If you've been living under a rock, Ben Shapiro is the guy from those SJW Destroyed Part 13 compilation videos, who's made a living for himself publishing for conservative rags funded by fracking billionaires, being racist to a point of indistinguishability between his rhetoric and that of literal fascists, being a warmonger, and by not being able to arouse his wife. He's recently begun a series in the vein of Johnny Harris titled Facts, with episode 2 titled Despite What You're Told, China Is Dying. Now China has many problems that deserve to be criticized, but Ben Shapiro is not at all honest in this video, as if we ever thought he would be. Let's take a look. Do note though, this is less defending China, whatever that means, and more fact-checking Benny Boy over here. China, you've been told, is a rising power. It's not that you've simply been told this, it's the objective truth, though slightly overstated. Of course, there's a massive drive to start a new Cold War, this time with China, and the propaganda system all across the West is busy trying to drum up fear-mongering half-truths, or many times our lies, in order to manufacture consent for the likely coming confrontation between the US and China. China is most likely going to be the largest economy on Earth very soon. They have established extensive trade relations globally. They develop more infrastructure than any other country. They're a rapidly rising scientific power too. With all that being said, China still is, on average and per capita, closer to a peripheral European nation than the United States. To compare it to the US is not only disingenuous, but also helps this ridiculous clash of titans framing that threatens even up to nuclear war if it's not checked. The real story of China is far, far scarier, because China is a power in a state of inevitable collapse. The only question is when and how much damage they'll do before the Chinese regime implodes. That's because China has at least five serious problems. You know, this is a common trope that just won't die regarding China. Several times a year, we're inundated with China will fall nonsense. From YouTube videos with angry Xi Jinping face thumbnails to Forbes and whatever other rag of the day, we've seen dozens of deadlines for China, and every single one of them was, unsurprisingly, bullshit. Ben is just continuing in that trend, which likewise will be bullshit. How do I know this? Because the popular hack, Gordon G. Chang, published similar nonsense arguments in the book The Coming Collapse of China, in which supposedly everything was gonna come tumbling down by 2012. This guy was invited to speak at the CIA for God's sake. I'll spare you Ben's voice and enumerate his arguments for him since he seemingly can't do it himself. Number 1. Demographics Ben states that China has a rapidly aging population. He shows a population pyramid, some stats on fertility, and quotes some guy that states China has a terminal demography, as if they just stopped having children altogether. Now yes, China will have issues derived from an aging population, but you know who else will? Nearly every single developed economy on Earth. Japan, Germany, the US, this is just how it will go. Unsurprisingly, this is the case for China as well. China has a declining fertility rate as a result of the long-standing, though now abolished, one-shot policy which in turn resulted in a noted gender gap in the traditionally sun-favoring nation. Less children means less average numbers of workers per retiree, and hence less productivity and heavier expenditures on the elderly. The difference being, China has established a track record of achieving its long-term economic and social goals as a result of their regular five-year plans, and a political system that allows planning longer than four-year election cycles. The Peking University Lancet Commission reveals some of the discussions currently ongoing, such as a move from disease-centered care to person-centered care, a shift of care to be primarily community and family-based rather than hospital-based, increased drive for health literacy, general improvements in socioeconomic conditions, social connections and leisure activities in quote-unquote age-friendly environments, amongst many other things. Of course, universal health coverage is necessary and is a priority that is making large gains. To quote the commission itself, it is imperative to take the window of opportunity afforded by China's economic growth to make coordinated efforts across sectors to address the concerns of an aging nation, which they are currently doing. Shapipi asks, in a heavily Marxist nation, who's gonna pay the bills? I don't think he knows what Marxism is, but aside from that, the answer is literally on the first page of Google. They already have an intricate and complex system spanning traditional welfare approaches, family responsibility programs, pension systems, and regular government spending. There is no mystery here. 
Ben makes a point on the one-child policy and boys being picked over girls, but this is number one something that affects other countries in the region, such as India and South Korea. Number two is officially illegal through forbidding fetal sex determination. And number three, complicated, as sex-selective abortion is illegal in China, but abortion itself is readily available. To quote a relevant article, It is often difficult to prove that an abortion has been carried out on sex-selective as opposed to family planning grounds. That same article states, recognition that intense intervention would be necessary to change these centuries-long traditions led to the Care for Girls campaign, instigated in 2013 by China's National Population and Family Planning Commission. The results have been encouraging. In 2007, a survey showed that the campaign had improved women's own perceived status and that the stated some preference had declined. Likewise, improvements in the general sex ratio. What does all of this mean? China has an issue with aging, that they're making good developments in meeting. Likewise, former Chinese policy decisions may have been mistaken, not applied to the necessary extent, or simply not applied at all at times. None of this implies the system is terminal, only the sex life of Miss Shapupu is, sadly. Back to the video in just a second, let's hear from today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. For a lot of research that I do for my videos, I end up hitting pages that aren't available in my location. That's frustrating as you can imagine, geo restriction really does suck. But not with Atlas VPN. For those unaware, a virtual private network makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted tunnel. This way it protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, and hides your IP address and your online activities. It even allows you to change your location for all your researching needs. Currently, Atlas VPN has more than 6 million users worldwide, and boasts the best VPN deal on the market, with the most affordable online protection plan for just under $2 per month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Go down to the description and click that link, use my code HAKIM and get a 3 year subscription for just $1.83 a month with 3 months free. But that's not all. You get blazing fast speeds for streaming or gaming, unlimited protection for all your devices, an inbuilt ad and malware blocker, and you'll get to save some extra cash as Atlas VPN will find you the best deals online for everything from your online subscriptions to airlines, hotels, and more. Grab this big deal because now Atlas VPN Premium is just $1.83 per month plus 3 months extra and with a 30 day money back guarantee. Protect your privacy and get the many benefits of Atlas VPN for this ridiculously low price. You can grab this deal by clicking the link in the video description below. Be quick as it's a time limited offer. Massive thanks to Atlas VPN for the sponsorship as well allows me to pay my editor fairly so the support is highly appreciated. All right, back to the video. Number two, lack of innovation. If China were free, you know, an innovative, robust economy, it might be possible to stave off disaster for at least a little while. After all, the generation of new products and services might allow China to thrive economically in the short term. That would buy time for the social system to transition away from high levels of government support and towards something more sustainable. But China has no innovation, thanks to its state-controlled mercantilist schemes. Gosh, he really is unlikable, isn't he? The smugness doesn't suit him in his general dorky delivery, but that doesn't change the fact that he's wrong and throws out ideological slogans as if they're fact. He claims being free is being an innovative and robust economy, which China already is. If they weren't, they wouldn't be surpassing the US, which had centuries of developments ahead of it. He seems to believe China's fall is inevitable, even if it were a liberal free market country. Why he believes this is a mixture of white supremacy and general American exceptionalism, but all in all just racist bullshit. Transitioning away from high levels of government support to something more sustainable, the US spends nearly a trillion dollars a year on its military. State subsidies are ubiquitous in the US economy, particularly in agriculture. Private corporations regularly receive tax money grants and pay no taxes themselves. Is this not high levels of government support? Does he consider this system sustainable? Onto the point itself, Ben is full of shit, as you probably surmised. China is incredibly innovative and is poised to become a global leader in innovation very soon, as it already is in certain sectors. China has the infrastructure, educated population, funding and expertise present. Chinese state support for innovation and support for indigenous development likewise helps their case in this. Entire books are being written on the topic currently, and why China is different in their innovation. To quote an extensive report by the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, in 2010, China's innovation and advanced industry capabilities were approximately 58% of US capabilities. By 2020, China's innovation and advanced industry capabilities increased to roughly 75% of US capabilities on a proportional basis and 139% in absolute terms. China is poised to overtake the US in both total as well as proportional innovative capacity within the next decade. These are facts that cannot be denied. Of course, the admitted racist Shapiro will nonetheless continue to deny these facts as that's his job, he's an ideologue and a particularly bad one at that. He really harps on about the oh, stealing technology bit despite 1. this being incredibly common in developing economies including the United States back in the day, 2. China's record on this is rapidly improving, and 3. the US and other economies continue to do the same. Ben badly delivers a simple point, that is that as China's working population declines, wages go up and so does automation, two things currently going on or developing in China. What's the issue here, exactly? 
there's a problem with this. If a robot can do a job more cheaply than a human, why produce in China at all, as opposed to somewhere that isn't a geopolitical hellhole run by an authoritarian communist government? Hmm, is he talking about the US here? Who knows? Safe to say this isn't an argument. Any economy that maintains relatively cheap access to inputs and labor will see interest regardless of politics, and the American fraternization with every fascist regime in existence is ample proof to that. By the way, totalitarian, human rights, blah blah, doesn't this dude have a hard-on for Israel? Get your priorities straight, my guy. He then claims nationalization kills innovation, which in China's case, as well as many others, is just patently false. This is simply lying. Even on the profitability point, he's wrong. He turns the patriotic up a few notches afterwards with China is costing us billions, while also not noticing the irony that his American use of Chinese labor saved the US billions just a few years back. The entire point is moot because he just restates the no innovation lie and builds on that, so he can pretty much throw out this entire section of his video. Number 3. Debt A funny point to bring up because China has 14 trillion dollars worth of debt and the US has 30. That's despite near similarly sized economies as well as China's population being 4 times that of the US. The US's debt to GDP ratio, a metric indicating stability in an economy towards paying back debts, is 116%, China's is 77%. These numbers change year to year, but generally, the US is worse off on this point, and not by a small margin. In the video, he does a little sleight of hand by referring to corporate debt in China, which is actually worse by percentage, but not total, terms than the US corporate debt, but that doesn't say much in and of itself. He goes on to state the usual horror stats. The nation's total stock of corporate, household, and government debt is now over 300% of GDP. It comprises 15% of all debt globally, according to the Institute of International Finance. He doesn't state how many, outside of the hopeful China is falling propaganda reporting push, think that this is way overblown. Overall, we think the risks around Chinese debt for investors are a bit overblown. Why? One key reason is that a large amount of Chinese corporate debt comes from banks, not the bond market. Within this bank debt, more than half is from a state-owned lender to a state-owned enterprise. Essentially, it's the government being indebted to itself, giving it a huge amount of control over said debt and making it a far lesser issue than it's being painted out to be. Likewise, researchers in China haven't missed the double standard, in which certain developments are ignored if they occur in the US or Europe, but highlighted if they occur in China. Chinese research work on this is likewise very sober and nuanced. Western acknowledgments of Chinese developments in combating corporate debt had been published since 2017, and clearly show that it's not an inability that's stopping the Chinese, but rather a delicate balance of continuously improving the situation while maintaining growth rates in the economy which currently seems to be working, seeing as growth continues above 5%, despite the current sad state of the global economy. Ben then quotes a Antonio Graceffo, a so-called China analyst that's known more for wrestling than anything else apparently, who also publishes what essentially amounts to the lowest ring of ideological nonsense at the Epoch Times. If you don't know, the Epoch Times was founded by cultists that believe in a race-segregated heaven, I'm not kidding, look it up, and has the express purpose of publishing mostly false or falsified anti-China material. I don't think this is the guy you want to be referencing, Benny. Anyways, he says what you expect, that China's gonna collapse tomorrow, blah blah blah, are you expecting anything else from this guy? No sources are given, of course. The best visible example of Chinese economic hollowness is its ghost cities. Literally cities that are just empty. China is chock-filled with these so-called ghost cities. They include, apparently, up to 65 million empty units of housing. That's all well and good, but just one issue. All those ghost cities are built ahead of expected migration waves from this still under-urbanized nation, which is exactly what's happening. Pudong was a ghost city and now has 50 million inhabitants. Kangbashi was empty a little while back and now is at 91% occupancy. The Binhai area near Tianjin has a population of over a million despite being a poster child for ghost cities in the western press. Even that weird housing estate that imitates Paris, Tian Dusheng, is now over capacity. Most of the time, the fanciful pictures people see are of cities that are still under construction and not planned to be finished for years, hence them being empty for the time being. That's not to say real estate developers aren't overbuilding in China, but as with most things regarding the country, the issue is blown far out of proportion. Wade Shepard, the guy who coined this entire phenomenon and a researcher of the concept stated, As of right now, in my opinion, the urbanization plan is working. It's still too early to tell, but there's evidence of these cities' slow development and they are slowly growing. They, meaning the Chinese, have these longer timelines, not a single one of which has expired at this point. So any way you look at this Ghost City critique, it's literally too early to tell. People are calling the game at halftime. Forbes reported, Today China's so-called ghost cities that were so prevalently showcased in 2013 and 2014 are no longer global intrigues. They have filled up to the point of being functioning normal cities. Ex-ghost cities are rarely news. This is all representative of a concept that those in the West don't see too much of. 
that being coordinated and planned development of infrastructure, called Infrastructure First in China. A perfect example of these misunderstood concepts could be found in the Qiaojiawan station, I probably mispronounced that. This is a stop in the rail transit system in Chongqing, which is one of the largest cities on earth currently. The station was constructed prior to residential, business and other development, and as a result essentially was a station that opened up to the middle of nowhere. The western press ran with this without any research or nuance, essentially attempting to make a racist point about Chinese primitiveness or other orientalist tropes. And just a few years later, it's now an integral point of public transport in a vibrant new part of the city. This is the essence of Chinese urban planning that is slowly being adopted outside of China as well. Chinese citizens keep putting their money in real estate because it allows them the illusion of actual ownership of something. And in a communist country, even the illusion of ownership is better than the reality that the government runs everything and you don't own anything. Again, very funny. Let's bring up our favorite Marx quote. You are horrified at our intending to do away with private poverty, but in your existing capitalist society, private poverty is already done away with for nine tenths of the population. Its existence for the few is solely due to its non-existence in the hands of those nine tenths. You reapproach us, therefore, with intending to do away with a form of property that necessary condition for whose existence is the non-existence of any property for the immense majority of society. Likewise, there's a difference between private and personal property, not that Ben here would know. The top 15 countries in home ownership are all either currently or former socialist nations, essentially all hovering around 90%. In the US, nearly half the population doesn't own a home, and full-time minimum wage workers can't afford rent of even a one-bedroom apartment in the entirety of the US, let alone a two-bedroom apartment. Number four, military problems. Yet another problem, military problems. Now, everybody thinks China is a powerful military country, and they kind of are. But with China on the brink economically and demographically, they might be expected to get more aggressive militarily. And again, China does keep threatening surrounding areas, including most prominently Taiwan. He's banking on the ignorance of some here. How can a country threaten itself? Taiwan is part of China, and the US government affirms the One China policy. The entire world, in fact, recognizes the One China policy. Taiwan currently exists solely as a US military outpost, and that is reaffirmed in internal US memos going back decades. Now, if you personally believe Taiwan should be independent, that's great. I love to see a zeal for self-determination, and I'm expecting you at the next pro-Palestine march, and, of course, to start boycotting. What's that? You're not interested? Then maybe interrogate why you care about Taiwan but not Palestine. Maybe it's because you're being told you should care and some uncritically internalize what's most beneficial to American ruling interests. The best parallel is this. If China had somehow helped the defeated confederacy movement carve out, let's say, California, then recognized it as the sole government of the US for decades afterwards, and then finally decided on strategic ambiguity on recognizing kind of both of them but not really, Afterwards, China had nukes pointed at the rest of the US, and repeatedly threatened war should the US rightfully reincorporate California into the US proper. China entirely funds this confederate California, uses it as a Chinese military base, uses it for cheap labor, for espionage against the US, amongst a thousand other provocations. Now, after all of this, all the Chinese-aligned media you see makes the US look like the warmonger, and China the peaceful ally just looking out for what's right. Wouldn't you at least slightly doubt what's going on? Yeah, that's kind of what it's like. The real warmonger in the region is the US, and you can check out my earlier video here for a deeper dive. Book recommendations and all. The US is hell-bent on provoking China, and that's quickly proven by a cursory view of recent US policies, which I recommend you check out here, in the interest of time. The entire rest of the bit essentially goes, the US military is better than the Chinese because the US military says so. The reality is clearly different, in a war between China and the US, everybody loses, but the US far more so. The US couldn't secure Iran in simulated war games. It's very optimistic to think the US could do anything about China. Here are two fantastic videos from Professor Cockshaw that delve deeper into this if you're interested. Another example of a company creating advanced products here in the United States is our trusted partner, GenuCell. You've heard about GenuCell on my daily show. GenuCell has great American-made products like their dark spot corrector. GenuCell couldn't be created or manufactured in China with the same level of innovation and care. <laughs> you can't make this shit up. What is this umbrella-ass commercial? It's all nonsense. The thing he's promoting, I mean. Basically, very casual skincare ingredients packaged and sold at a premium with the occasional fanciful claim on the packaging. Drink enough water, moisturize, use sunscreen, stay out of the sun, and get good sleep. There you go. And you actually have a real doctor advising you on like this quack. Number 5. Dictatorship He claims China has a one-party dictatorship. It doesn't. There are eight other parties in China working in consultation with the CPC. Whether you believe they're just ornaments or genuine is a question of personal bias, honestly. But this is a trope that needs to die. The Chinese political system is incredibly elaborate as well as participatory. It's not only reductive to dismiss that, but also just lazy. 
The vast majority of the Chinese population supports their direction development and considers themselves to be part of a democracy. There's a handy Who Runs China infographic that helps visualize Chinese government's emotion for a quick look. Though the greatest intro into China I've read is Roland Bohr's Socialism and Chinese Characteristics. If you're generally interested in understanding China and the Chinese perspective, then this is the book to read. Much more interestingly is the juxtaposition with the US, of all things, which is touted as the world's democracy. Is that really the case, though? JT from Second Thought makes a strong case towards reevaluating the idea here. I don't personally care for your opinions as to whether China is a democracy or not. What's important is the strange biases that don't apply to the US but always seem to apply for China. Likewise, the vast majority of people who talk about the China dictatorship nonsense seem to be incredibly ignorant of the Chinese political structure and system. Moving on, interestingly, Ben Shapiro is a known climate change denier and has worked for many other climate change deniers. Yet in this segment, he blames China for more carbon emissions. How a climate denier suddenly starts caring, I don't know, but he's missing one important fact. China is the leading green energy power. China's strides in green energy are at a pace and scale so large that they're seemingly the only legitimate hope of limiting climate change. China is in very serious trouble. Does this mean that China is going to break apart into a million polities? No, but it means that the current regime is on shaky footing. And that means they are likely to get very aggressive in the near term in an attempt to shore up their foundation. Because if they don't, that collapse is going to happen sooner rather than later. Wow, that's a drop off in tone from the bombastic, they're collapsing in 30 seconds rhetoric we saw in the beginning. Of course, no sources anywhere, just annoyingly edited zooms of articles and the occasional quote from a quack of some sort. And that's that. I really hope you weren't expecting anything else. China is very interesting, but you need the prerequisite knowledge before you just start talking shit. Let me throw some book recommendations at you. The Basic Economic System of China is an excellent primer for a modern Chinese perspective on their economy. Red Star Over China by Edgar Snow and Fan Shen by William Hinton, and all of Hinton's books honestly, for the revolutionary period are also excellent. There's also Marxism and Socialism with Chinese Characteristics by Jin Hu Ming for a modern Chinese political perspective, and of course the Battle for China's Past by Mo Gao for an interesting historical dive into the Mao era. There's much more, but that can wait till another day. If you're further interested in China's economy, the Tiananmen Square event, Tibet, Xinjiang, or anything else, I've left some great resources in the further reading section of the pinned comment. That's all for this time. If you enjoy what I do, then please consider supporting me on Patreon, it really does help. I'd like to thank my patrons, so thank you to Nitro Dubs, Kenny, Thomas Roberts, Nicholas, Owen Baker, T. Wood, Dr. Lemonman, Lumix, Charlie and Eric, Ultimate Turin, Daniel Ethel, The Generic Guy, Santiago Pereira, Rain, Xander Corvus, David Fries, Confuse M, Mariana Mustasevich, Robbie Richardson, and Masei Kudrow. Thanks for watching.